week on Africa Weekly. We take you to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where thousands of people who have fled the various conflicts in their country will not be able to vote in the postponed presidential election. And we stay in the DRC to take a look at the state of the country's infrastructure, one of the bargaining chips some politicians are using to shore up support in the upcoming poll. But first, a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. Madagascar's two former presidents went head-to-head -head in Wednesday's runoff presidential election in a hotly contested two-man race that saw voters almost coming to blows as the polls closed. The contenders Andrei Rajuelina and Mark Ravolomanana came a close first and second in November's first round election, with Rajuelina winning 39% compared with 35% for Ravolomanana. The EU observer mission said the vote had been well organized and calm and called for candidates and their supporters to wait patiently for the official results. There was this fear before the first election that one of the candidates would proclaim himself as the winner. Now we are hoping that they have learned this lesson. As in the first round, it must remain calm until the results are announced. Elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo, due to take place on Sunday, have been postponed after electronic voting machines were destroyed in a suspected arson attack on a warehouse last week. President Joseph Kabila is scheduled to step down after nearly 18 years in power following the elections, which are already two years overdue. We have postponed election for seven days. And the election is going to take place on the 30th of December this year. Nearly 8,000 of some 10,000 voting terminals for the capital Kinshasa were destroyed in the blaze last Wednesday. The postponement comes as problems have piled up ahead of the December 23rd vote with violence at electoral rallies, inter-ethnic conflict, militia attacks in the east and an Ebola outbreak. The opposition UDPS party warned of a mass mobilization of the people if elections are delayed any further. If there are elections on the 30th, you will turn out en masse for the side of change. If there are no elections, we call on you all to mobilize until Joseph Kabila leaves power. Two Scandinavian hikers were found dead with cuts to their throats in Morocco's High Atlas Mountains, a popular trekking destination for tourists, on Monday. Moroccan authorities arrested more than a dozen suspects after the discovery of the two women's bodies. The victims from Denmark and Norway, both in their 20s, had been sharing a tent 10 kilometers from the mountain village of Imlil, where their bodies were found. Imlil is a starting point for trekking and climbing tours of Mount Tubkal, which at 4,167 meters is the highest summit in North Africa. Hundreds of people went out onto the streets of Freetown on Saturday to call for an end to sexual violence against women, including the First Lady of Sierra Leone, Fatima Bio. The previous week, Bio launched Hands Off Our Girls, a program aimed at combating sexual violence, child trafficking and prostitution, child marriage and teenage pregnancy. The demonstration took place just days after the Sierra Leone government promised a crackdown on rape and sexual abuse, as the number of officially reported cases of sexual violence has nearly doubled in the past two years to over 8,500 cases. Many sexual assault victims in Sierra Leone are teenagers, but younger children are also affected, with some abuse victims not even a year old. South African police said on Wednesday that an arrest warrant had been issued for Grace Mugabe, the wife of former Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe. Grace Mugabe was accused of allegedly assaulting a model in Johannesburg in 2017 using an electrical extension cord at an upmarket hotel where her two sons were staying. At the time, the government granted Mugabe diplomatic immunity, allowing her to leave South Africa. The model suffered cuts to her forehead and the back of her head. And staying in South Africa, Afrikaners gathered near the South African town of Dundee in KwaZulu-Natal on Sunday to commemorate the 180th anniversary of the victory of the Voortrekkers over the Zulus during the Battle of Blood River in 1838. 180 years have passed, but um, 
we have approached a time in these days where we again experience the threats um, that can and potentially have the, the ability to annihilate our nation. Um, there's all kinds of psychological, economical, physical threats. Jean Bienvenu is a former associate of opposition politician Jean Pierre Bemba. In 2008, he had to leave his hometown of Kinshasa, fleeing state persecution. It's very tough seeing what's happening in Kinshasa but not being able to go back. It's not easy. He is just one of some 15,000 citizens of the Democratic Republic of the Congo that now live across the border in Congo Brazzaville. According to the United Nations Refugee Agency, nearly three quarters of a million Congolese have fled the various conflicts in their home country. So far, Uganda has taken in the most Congolese refugees, with many living in harsh conditions in camps surrounding Lake Albert. Jerome has lived here since the age of nine. He is not optimistic about the likelihood of change in his country of origin. Why would I go back to the Congo? I would just have to come back here again because of the war. Some refugees put down roots in their host country, like here in the Zambian capital of Lusaka. Bernard Pierre Lukungu has lived here since 1993, he also has his worries about the election back in the DRC. We are almost to 25,000. And uh, if truly things will go, uh, you know, haywire, we are afraid many will enter Zambia. And then it is a situation that we don't want to happen because this will, will destabilize this country. We don't want that. They hope that the upcoming election will bring change that will allow their lives to return to normal. If not, many may choose to join the large community of citizens who have sought to live their lives elsewhere. Founded before the country's independence, the international port of Matadi is one of the DRC's few access points to the sea. Day and night, employees unload containers full of imported products, heading for the markets of Kinshasa. Not much has changed since the creation of the port, and most of the equipment is now well out of date. It's true that the National Transport Agency is still using equipment left over from the colonial period, but it's also true that we've got skilled workers who are really putting in a good shift. With the election rapidly approaching, the improvement of port facilities is one of various issues vying for attention from politicians. What I want us to do after the elections is to quickly renovate the port. Once the trucks are fully loaded, it's time to start the long journey to Kinshasa. Heading in the opposite direction, trucks loaded with wood and minerals to be exported overseas. Not all complete the journey. This is one of the world's most dangerous roads. Manzeza uses the route several times every week. I've seen many accidents on many occasions. People die in ways you can't imagine. Heads smashed in, parts scattered about. You see their guts and all that. That's the damage you get with these vehicles. It's serious. Drivers have to pay a $10 toll to make use of the road. It's a lot of money in a country where most people get by on less than $2 a day. Aware of these issues, various candidates in this month's election are promising to sink billions of dollars into developing the country's infrastructure. It remains to be seen which of the candidates' claims have done the most to sway the country's 40 million strong electorate. The Indoni festival kicked off in the South African city of Durban this weekend. Twelve groups from across the country represented their respective tribes over the two-day pageant which aims to showcase and embrace South Africa's cultural diversity. In Kenya, members of the Maasai community took part in a special Maasai Olympics on Saturday, organized to save endangered lions by fostering a culture shift from hunting lions to hunting cash prizes. 
For generations, Maasai warriors proved their manhood by killing a lion, but a campaign led by Kenyan Olympic champion David Rudisha is working to swap spearing for sport. That's all from us at Africa Weekly. Until next week. Thank you.